So I've got a series of questions. Uh, thank you for everybody who posted them. Um, there's also a, a chat box. You might be able to drop something in there. I could probably see that if I can't see all of your faces. And if I can't see you, well, then it probably means uh, I'm not going to be able to take a follow-up question from you directly. So anyway, this is the first time we're doing it. Give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Uh, I'll, I'll take on uh, the first question, uh, which comes from Allison down in Australia. And I know Allison when she used to live in the UK. And she had a baby seven weeks ago. I'm scrolling through it. Here it is. All right. So I just marked that one. Uh, so she had a baby seven weeks ago, and uh, she thinks she has uh, diastasis recti, which is a big anatomical word, which basically means that um, the place in the rectus abdominis muscle, the one in the center of your abdomen, uh, tore a little bit while she was pregnant. Um, so the question is... Um, how do you test for it, which honestly I don't know. It usually looks just slightly distended in a small section of it. Uh, and of course, you guys know I'm not a doctor, so I'm not diagnosing anything today. But I might get close. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, usually there's a, a little area of distension going on there. And I'll show you an image. I should be able to screen share here. If I switch to this one. There we go. I, I pulled this up. Um, the rectus abdominis is the whole red muscle there, and down the center of it is something called the linea alba. That's the part that separates or tears. Um, and uh, when that happens, that's what I was saying, it distends. So let me get out of the screen share for a second. There we go. And uh, the question about what to do about it. So there's kind of a fine line. If it's, if it's large, then you probably, it's possible that you even need surgery to stitch it back together. If it's small, usually exercising in the form of strengthening, abdominal strengthening exercises, you might just start with really simple static high planks, those kind of things, and build up into doing um, even sit-ups or navasana or boat pose, if you like, uh, to strengthen it. Again, that's if it's small. If it's large, you sh you'll know. Go to the doctor. All right. I, what I would also say is don't do anything that stretches it too far because stretching it too much uh, could lead to it not binding so well. So you want to get it so that it's binding up and the scar tissue is forming. This is a case where you want scar tissue to form to bind it up. All right. And then I've got a question here from Brian. I know Brian as well. Uh, Brian Percy is having a case of medial epicondylitis. Uh, so what's medial epicondylitis? That's when you have pain on the inside of your elbow. Let me go grab my bones. So, oh, sorry about the flashing. Uh, we should sort that out. Okay, so here's the humerus. Here's uh, the ulna and the radius next to it. This is the inside of the elbow, and it's technically called the medial epicondyle. So itis is inflammation, so when you have an inflammation of the medial epicondyle, sometimes called golfer's elbow, uh, you have pain there. Now, Brian's question in particular, uh, I should have selected it first. There we go. Select it that way. Uh, so Brian's question about medial epicondylitis, uh, he mentions also that he's got uh, a big knot in his back and shoulder uh, which is a little bit more telling. So usually when somebody presents medial epicondylitis or pain on the inside of their elbow, my first thought is usually to think about the flexors of the forearm. Uh, we use them a lot, whether it's for typing, working on the computer, or if we have a job where we have to grasp or grab things regularly that, that could lead to inflammation of those muscles. Um, but because he, he said two things in his question. One, it's more irritated when he massages the area on the inside of the upper arm, not the lower arm. And he's talking about this thing going on in his shoulder and neck. So, Brian, if you're watching this, um, you probably want to check the nerves as they come out of your neck. It could be at the, uh, at the cervical spine itself. 
It could be after they exit there and be compressed by muscles, but because you're feeling it worse up there, it probably means that the nerve is irritated above the elbow. So it might not be the more classic case of medial epicondylitis. Uh, and the reason I got there one more time is because he's saying that it's irritated more when he massages the upper arm, and he's complaining about stuff going on in his neck as well. So those two things would lead me to say it might be more of a nerve issue and from higher up. All right, let me close that question down. Let's see what else we got here. Um, so Guy Anderson has posted a couple of questions relating to hands-on adjustments. Uh, you know, it's a subject that I take uh, close and dear to my heart. So um, he, he, there's two parts to his questions. Let me find uh, the first one. Um, so the first question is how is he is um, is related to students have a fear of being touched or adjusted, and if a student has a fear of being adjusted, do you recommend never adjusting them? and um, just working with probably verbal cues or something along those lines. My answer is no. I don't recommend that. Um, there may have to be some self-reflection going on. Uh, if a student is saying that they don't want to be touched by you, it's possible that you smell. This isn't personal to you, Guy, of course. Um, it's, it's possible that, and more likely, that they have a lack of trust. Um, it could be in you specifically. Again, not specific to you, Guy, uh, but anybody. Either they don't trust you, or it, there could be much deeper, larger problems that they're um, needing to deal with in order to uh, feel comfortable being touched by somebody else. So it can, it can go a, quite a large spectrum of reasons why that might happen. Uh, so what I would suggest is a conversation. And you need to open the space in those situations so that the student feels comfortable giving you really honest feedback about what's going on, especially if it's related to you. If it's something personal to them, they might not want to share that. And it's not like we're all therapists and we should, you know, be prying into people's personal lives, even though um, when you have students and they practice with you a lot, you know, there is a lot of um, intimate, so to speak, relationship going on. There's a lot of personal relationship going on. So the other thing might be that um, it's a new student or it's somebody who you've never seen before. That alone might be a reason not to do a lot of adjustments on a student. All right. Um, so he has a couple of follow-up questions here. I'll try to get to... So his next question, I'll select it here, uh, is about being injured while being adjusted. Uh, sorry to hear that. It does happen. Um, and he also comments that it, there's not always time to say stop or, you know, don't adjust me at the moment when somebody um, is adjusting you. So if you're in that situation, there are times where um, it's almost better to surrender to it because if you brace against somebody putting physical pressure into you, uh, depending on where it is, what the adjustment is, and how it's happening, that actually is more likely lead to lead to injury. So if you start by, if you know, in our typical reactions of fear, we're, we're scared something's about to happen, so we hold our breath and our body quite instinctually tightens up. And both of those um, could lead to injury. So I, I can recall a couple of stories of uh, John Scott telling me that when uh, he first met Patabi Joyce, and Patabi Joyce did quite strong adjustments back in the old days, uh, he would just have to surrender. He would just completely let go, completely trust, and just let it happen. And in those times, he didn't get injured. That's not that that's going to happen every time either, especially uh, in the modern day. Um, if you do get injured, you should let that teacher know because it's, it's possible that they didn't know. 
um, or they it might help them to self-reflect on being more present when they're adjusting students and or to look for signs. Um, I talk a lot about this in my hands-on adjustment DVDs, which of course you can buy at yoganatomy.com. Uh, in the intro section, all of the parts of um, adjustments being essentially a practice on top of our yoga practice. And, you know, all of life is a yoga practice. It's a practice of deepening our awareness to the present moment. And um, if you're not aware of what's going on in the present moment, it's more likely students are going to get injured um, while being adjusted. And as a follow-on to this, there's also a question about injuries as, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Right. That's the half post. Here it is. Um, I'll select this question now. This is from Jennifer. Um, With time and getting into more challenging postures, I've had injuries seem to occur more frequently. I've learned to back off. But I was wondering how your experience with injuries has evolved with your advanced practice. Well, with advanced practice comes advanced aging. Uh, Not that I'm particularly old, but as we age, injuries, um, you know, either pop up more often or uh, don't heal as well. So re-injuries are are a little bit more likely. Um, And I wanted to play off of this one next because, as Jennifer aptly states, um, you know, she's... She's always learning to back off, which means she's paying attention to what's going on in the moment. So the more we... Yeah, that is my dog back there. Sorry. Um, with with time and uh, learning to you know, feel and sense what's going on in our body, it's more likely that we would back off before we injure ourselves. We, we should be more in touch with whether or not we're having a particularly flexible day or we're having a particularly... Um, tight day or stiff day or whatever, and adapt our practice to that, which is what we want to do. Now, the other thing that happens, and this isn't necessarily specific to Jennifer's question, is that we start to identify, overly identify, and attach onto our asana practice. And then there's a fear of getting injured. There's a fear of not being able to practice. And all of these lead to uh, us not being as present with what's going on in the moment. Uh, it's, it's classic. I mean, Patavi Joyce used to say all the time, don't fear. And I always interpreted that as have faith. And so injury or no injury, posture or no posture, uh, there's loads of opportunities to practice. Um, I know her question is more on the anatomical side of things. Um, and so I'll take it a step further in that direction now, which is there's, there's kind of two categories, if you will, of injuries. There's the type of injury that, you know, it's kind of like something that's building over a long period of time, and then you do the slightest thing, and you end up bumping over some line, and now you're quote-unquote injured. And then there's the type of injury that is not slow building, but it's all happening in a moment. You just twist a little bit too far. You've never had anything going on in that area, and all of a sudden, you know, you tweak some oblique muscle or something in your ribs or something like that. Um, Those are much harder to avoid because they're kind of instantaneous and you don't really sense them coming. The ones that nag for a while and you kind of have this back and forth relationship with it and then you push it over some edge, uh, those are the ones that you have to be even more present, more vigilant in when you start to do your practice. You need to take your time with those things. Um, on, On my personal level, I always seem to have at least one thing going on and occasionally two things going on that I'm always working with or around in my body. And let's be honest, you know, the, the, it's, we're doing physical practice. Uh, so we're using our physical body, and it's likely that we're going to have sensations and even possibly injuries, hopefully not really bad injuries, but, you know, mild injuries, discomforts, uh, areas of irritation going on. Um, to be honest with you, as of the last six months to a year, I've gone much more into a meditation practice, 
I still do practice. I still do a regular practice, but I'm really not trying to achieve much in the way of advanced asana at the moment. I might go back into that. I might not. I honestly don't know. So uh, I think that covers Jennifer's question pretty well. And let's see, what's the next one up here? Uh, so I've got one from Jody, Jody Dixon. Uh, for Ekapada Shirshasana, is it more important to establish external rotation first or knee behind shoulder movement? So uh, let's do this part of the question first. Uh, both are important. So there's a, an obvious external rotation of the leg as it goes behind your head. And there's also a going backward along with that rotation that has to happen. So in the first part, she's talking about getting the knee behind the shoulder movement. That's the straight back. Um, and that movement has mostly to do with hamstrings, possibly adductors. Um, essentially, putting your leg behind your head is a deep forward bend. Uh, it's so much of a forward bend that your torso ends up in front of your thigh. Then you add on the rotational part to it. Both are important. I'm, I'm not sure which one is most important first or that one is more important first. The only exception I would say or, or thought that occurs to me now is that some people have uh, more ease in going straight back. Some people have more of an ease in doing the external rotation. So my sense would be to deal with the harder stuff first. So if you have a harder time externally rotating your leg, focus on that part first. If you have a harder time with your hamstrings, do that part first. In both of them, try to maintain the spine as upright as possible. That's going to encourage the movement to go into the hip joint and not fall into the spine going into flexion, which is one of the bigger problems that happens with leg behind head. And Quite naturally, uh, the moment you start to take your leg back there, uh, your pelvis is going to posteriorly rotate, your spine is going to flex and bend, so you're going to get round in the front of your body. The tighter your hip is, the more of that you're going to have to do. The more of that you do, the more pressure goes into the spine. So the second part of her question is, once foot is behind the head, should it be drawn across the back or just draw the leg down the back? Um, I vote for the second one with an exception. And you'll find that I always have the exceptions because we all have slightly different anatomy. If you're a longer-legged person with a shorter torso and you pull your leg too far across, you end up with more of your, I'll use this as my, your calf muscle up high and your leg sticking up like this and it's putting more pressure at the top of your head, which causes more neck strain. What you want is more of the ankle sitting lower at the base of your head so that you have leverage to lift your head back. So I don't think it's required for everybody that the leg be taken across unless you're, you have shorter legs. And in that case, you will have to do that, otherwise your foot won't cross onto the other side of your shoulders. So long leg, less important to take it across, shorter leg, more important. Both of those people are going to have to engage their hamstrings to some degree to pull the leg down behind the head. And that's going to take it lower on the neck. The lower it is on the neck, once again, the more leverage you'll get by lifting your chin up. All right, I hope that helps, Jody. Uh, let's see, what else do we got here? Here's one from Oren. <laughs> How would you approach a student that has had a shoulder dislocation and they are experiencing pain and discomfort during their practice? What asana should they do and don't? Modifications, etc. So if somebody has already dislocated their shoulder, it means that they have already stretched the connective tissues, the joint capsule, and especially at the shoulder joint uh, beyond its normal, its normal range of motion. So what you, what you want to happen is you want that to heal. So at first, I would probably assume that a physio or physical therapist 
would have that person doing very minimal movement and, if anything, strength training work. Bindings, taking the arms behind the back and grabbing another foot or something like that, not a good idea. Weight bearing, probably not a good idea. All of this would also depend on um, their age, their strength, how long ago it was, right? A lot of factors. So I, I can't say specifically for this case, um, but that person is probably going to quickly figure out what movements they shouldn't do on their own. They're going to feel it start to slip. Uh, so in those cases, I often look for the student to get the information out of them as to uh, what they can and can't do, and then base the modifications off of that. All right, I'm going to leave that as it is. Uh, let's see what else we got. Stacy, I know Stacy. Stacy from North Carolina. Uh, where do you? Where do I stand? Where do me? Uh, where do I stand on bending the knees deeply, basically laying the chest on the thighs and standing forward fold for beginners who are stiff? Well, if that's the only way their hands are going to reach the floor, I think they're going to have to bend their knees. So I am okay with it. Um, the encouragement would be as soon as their hands go to the floor in the forward fold that they try to put some energy into straightening their knees. This is what I always say in the workshops because uh, if you leave it too passive, it's possible that you irritate one end or the other of the hamstrings. The one that usually gets irritated, of course, is the sit bone. Um, it brings up something else uh, which I'll talk about for a moment, which is this idea of sort of, um, this isn't specific to Stacy's question, but it's related in my mind, so this has nothing to do with you, Stacy, or how, you're, uh, how the student is working, but our overall idea of getting things right and doing things the right way. Uh, I can tell by the way Stacy wrote a question, and I know her. She's an Ashtanga practitioner. Ashtangis were the worst at getting things right versus getting things wrong. Uh, actually, we're not the worst at it. We're just as bad as everybody else. And um, this whole idea of getting things right or getting things wrong leads us down a very slippery slope. There's a tradition that we might be trying to live in, whether it's Ashtanga or Iyengar or some other tradition. It might be a general Hatha Yoga maybe Shivananda or something like that, um, where what, what we're really trying to do is um, lead our students down a path of progression. The ideal might be that you forward fold with completely straight legs the entire time, palm the floor completely, have your chest, your abdomen, and your face all up against your legs but we all can't be there from the beginning. So it is always okay to meet the student where they're at. That's not uh, bypassing tradition in any way, shape, or form. As long as you have the end goal in mind and you're leading the student there step by step, you're doing the right thing as far as I'm concerned. So you have to do what it takes. Hopefully, I would assume all of us as teachers, we have a logic behind why we're breaking postures down in a particular way or the process that we're taking our students through to lead them to the next step and the next step and the next step, all of which lead to that ideal. So ideal right, any modification wrong, I think is a bad way to think about it. Um, ideal is just that, it's an ideal. Maybe we'll get there, maybe we won't get there. That's my experience at least. All right, I'll close that question down. Um, let's see, what is it called? Uh, in Prasarita Padottanasana, if I bend my knees and come up to a squat-like position and hang out there doing arm stuff or something, should I change the position of my feet so that knees don't fall inward like they tend to while the feet are parallel? Uh, well, if you're in Prasarita, your legs are wide. Um, they're kind of at an angle heading out to the floor. And when you bend your knees, as long as they're staying forward relative to that line, you should be okay. If you see that it's rotating in, um, then certainly, you know, when, whenever our legs are weight-bearing, um, especially I would guess in a posture like Prasarita Padottanasana, 
Uh, you've got weight falling through them at an angle. The better the alignment, the the safer you would be. I, I would agree with that. So yeah, try to try to keep those knees straight and in line if you can. Uh, let's see. Several. I got that one. Uh, Fiona has a question here. Let me select that one. Are we doing on time? All right. Uh, one of my guys in my men's class asked me last week why Ardha Bada Padma seated is so much harder than Ardha Bada Padma standing. It never occurred. Mm, not having seen this person do it, it's harder to analyze why it might be harder for them to do it on the floor. I'm going to throw a guess out, though. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong. When they were trying to do it standing, they probably bent their knees. That might have reduced the amount of resistance in their, their, their standing leg hamstrings, maybe allowing them to fold forward more. Uh, maybe when they were sitting, they weren't doing that. Um, and I'm making a guess that they have tight hamstrings, which means the pelvis is dropped back, which means they have a tendency to fall back, probably a little bit harder to stay upright and get your arm as far around. Fiona, send me an email. Let me know if I got even close to that uh, assessment based on your question. Uh, let's see. There's a couple of other questions hiding in here. I've got to scroll through them. Here we go. Uh, when doing fire log, there's a Sanskrit name for this apparently, uh, when, the, when the knee of the top leg points toward the ceiling instead of the wall, what is the most likely the cause? Thanks, Nan. So, uh, so Nan, I have a video on the website, and it's called Preparation for Lotus. You can, there's a little search box, search box on the home page. You can type in Preparation for Lotus, and you'll find it right away. I go over Agni Stambhasana, and um, I give all the reasons why. And the basic reason why is the, the rotators of the hip joint are tight. Secondarily, the adductors of the hip joint might be tight. And the last possibility is that it's a bone shape issue, and the person might have particularly tight, uh, uh, tight fitting joint, or not enough space there, and that's why their knee is pointing up towards the ceiling. Uh, let's see, Michael Goulet in Janu Shir Shasana, head to knee pose, uh, and other knee bending poses. My knee joint seems to pop out of place in a slightly painful way. When I straighten my leg, it will pop back in place. What causes this, and is there a solution? Well, there's a few reasons it could be happening. I'm going to guess because it's painful, you want to be, let me start there. Because it's painful, be careful. Uh, if, it's, if it's painful, it means it's irritating something. Often I would guess that the meniscus is the popping sound that you hear. Uh, that is the femur, the bottom of the thigh bone is slipping over the edge of the meniscus. That's a common cause of cracking sounds in, uh, in the knee joint in particular. And within this posture in particular, when you, uh, when you sit in Janu Shasana and you have your leg in that position and you fold forward, depending on how open your hip joint is, the, um, the femur starts to rotate internally when you maximize the amount of movement at the hip joint. So it's probably getting pulled forward a little bit, and that's the point where you hear the popping sound. So I'm going to suggest you do two things. I'll give you a modification, even though you didn't necessarily... Well, you asked for a solution, so you did. Sorry. Um, try two things. One, um, try elevating your knee. See if that reduces the amount of pressure coming out of the hip and into the knee. So you might put a block under it. Do that just as an experiment. See what happens. The second thing to do is to not close the knee off, the, the knee joint off so much. So take the foot and extend it out a little bit further than you might normally do for Janu Shir Shasana and see if that changes things as well. So that might give you a little bit of, um, a little bit of space and play until you figure out some other stuff to do with that. Uh, the other option is, and I just thought about this, uh, on the YouTube channel, where this is going to post to when it's over, uh, there's also a segment from my Yoga Anatomy videos 
on the knee that's posted up there, and I go over a couple of things about uh, externally rotating the knee joint. I would check out that video. That'll go over a couple of things I just mentioned and might give you some other clues to what's going on. All right. All right, it's 1.31. I wanted to leave this to 30 to 45 minutes, so I think I'm going to make this the last question. So this is from Rohit. Uh, he's been doing a Shanga Vinyasa style primary series for, for the past year. He injured his back shoveling snow. Uh, the massage therapist stated it was his QL muscle. What kind of modifications do I need to do? Um, uh, Rohit, um, it's not that specific of a question, but um, I'll take it on uh, nonetheless. So there's a couple of assumptions here that I'll have to make. One is that the QL muscle is actually the cause of your back pain. And there's a couple of really good articles on the website that um, talk about the QL and the psoas and gluteal muscles. That was a very popular post. Um, that might clue you into a couple of things. I would say the, the, the follow-up question, and, and here's where you always get with injury type questions, or this is where I always get. Assessment is always the key to making a clear and proper, let's call it a diagnosis, even though I don't diagnose anyone. Uh, better word is assessment. So in order for me to, to, to do a really good assessment, I need to be able to ask you questions and hear your answers. Um, I would have you check two things. One, if you're in more of a back bend, does it feel better or worse at that point? And also, does it feel more like it's stretching when you do postures, let's say, like plow or halasana pose? Um, and does that stretching feel like a good thing? And those would be the ways in which we would figure out whether that's the right thing to do. Assuming it's your QL uh, and you want to stretch it, uh, you can do any type of uh, side angles, triangle to stretch that muscle, or even a parigasana. Uh, might uh, help stretch that out for you. All right? See how you go. You can always send me uh, an email and we could always do a uh, uh, personal Skype chat uh, consultation if you, if you really feel the need for that. All right, I'm going to finish that question up. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And um, this is going to post to YouTube anyway. And we'll see how the technology works in the end. And uh, I'll keep you posted on Hangouts that are going to happen in the future. And just so everybody's clear, the question and answer program works really well when the questions are posted ahead of time. And it helps me prepare as well. So thanks very much for everybody tuning in. Really appreciate it. Have a great day.